Hello and welcome back to the CCNA journey with me, Ryan. And in this section, we're going to continue with network access and focusing on the topic of Ether Channel and within Ether Channel, the protocol LACP, the Link Aggregation Control Protocol. For those who don't know, you can contact me here on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. So what is an Ether Channel? Well, in its harsh terms, an Ether Channel is a logical interface which represents multiple physical interfaces. And effectively, what I mean by that is if we go back and have a think about our switches today, let's say, for example, we have uh, two switches down here, and this is at the access layer, and this is where our PCs plug into. And again, down here, a couple more PCs. And we know from previous design talks that this access layer uh, most likely goes up to a distribution layer. Well, the problem we've got here is the if this was the kind of network design, well, the link between the access layer and the distribution layer is actually only one link. And for resiliency purposes, it might be wise to actually add another link in there to connect the two switches together. So we actually have two links connecting them. So the idea being is that if one link fails, the other link will take over. But the problem with that sort of logic is that it isn't really, at least most of the time, isn't that straightforward. And the reason for that, at least in our scenario here, is because of something called the spanning tree protocol. Now, I'm not gonna get into too much detail what spanning tree is, it's actually the next topic in the course, but effectively spanning tree is gonna to try to prevent a layer two loop from occurring. And in turn, the way it does that is it disables ports. So if we have a cable between this switch and another cable between this switch, then spanning tree will actually see this as a loop. And the reason it will see it as a loop is because traffic will get broadcasted out into this switch. This switch will broadcast it back down to this switch. This switch will broadcast it back up to this switch. And what you're left with is a frame will continuously loop in the network. So in order to stop that from happening, what's happened here is an ether channel where we do the um, representation of a multiple physical interfaces with a logical interface. An ether channel allows us to bundle both these ports together and allow this switch and this switch to communicate for a protocol called LACP which is the link aggregation control protocol. And when they communicate, they both agree that even though there are two physical interfaces between each other, they will treat it as a single logical interface. So the idea being is that when protocols like spanning tree starts looking at this network design, from its perspective, it sees a single port, but physically there are actually two ports underneath. Okay, so that's kind of an example of what we're doing here. We're effectively, we're effectively taking a multiple physical ports and we're bundling them together and we're having both sides of the devices, in this case the switches, agree that these two physical ports will be represented as one port. And then obviously what that means for us is that allows kind of engineers to double to an extent, and I'll explain why an extent, double the bandwidth capability or capacity even on these links. Because let's say this was a one, one uh, gigabit per second link, well, all of a sudden we've just bundled another gigabit per second link and now we have two gigabit per seconds. So all of a sudden we've actually got better capacity. We've also got better resiliency because if a port dies, traffic can just continue around the other port without being service impacting. So we've got better resiliency. What it also means is, let's say for example, that this switch up here has um, only one gig interfaces and the switch down here is only have one gig interfaces. Well, if we do not introduce a link aggregation protocol like LACP for an ether channel, which is what we've just discussed, then what we're left with is having to pull out this switch and put a switch with 10 gigabit per second interfaces in. So it gives us incremental upgrades. 
So the idea being, you know, I know I said spanning tree and spanning tree can be uh, not a very nice topic to a lot of people. And you'll see why, if you're not aware of spanning tree, you'll see why when it comes up in my video. But let's take a step back and just have a look at what an EFA channel is doing. It's taking two physicals, two physical cables, and it's agreeing between two devices that these two physical cables will be one logical interface. And all other protocols, anything running over the top of it, will see it as one physical interface. So that's important to understand. So it's not, it sounds a little bit complex to begin with, but when you actually see the configuration in Packet Tracer, it's very simple. But the benefits outweigh a lot of the, the downfalls of doing it. And there are downfalls of doing Ether Channel. In fact, there are many downfalls, and it's one of the protocols that unfortunately bites uh, a lot of production engineers through error or through um, just poor behavior on the devices. Because Ether Channels don't always play nice. But nonetheless, an Ether Channel is simply that. So very straightforward so far. So why do we use an Ether channel? So like I just said, if we have um, a switch that only has, that's supposed to be a switch. If we have a switch that only has one gigabit per second interfaces and another switch that only has one gigabit per second interfaces, then rather than having to say, ah, we have our cable between the switches, but now we actually want more bandwidth. Well, we're going to have to replace the switch with bigger ports. Well, what we can actually do is use multiple ports, ports. And you notice I'm doing multiple ports here. And we can say, actually, I'm going to bundle four interfaces together. And effectively, I'm going to get four gigabit per second throughput. Now, you can have up to eight active ports in a bundle but you can configure 16. And what I mean by that is that if you put eight ports in the bundle, all eight will be uh, used and port number nine up to 16 will stand in idle. And if one of these ports effectively dies, then this port will then take over its place. But eight ports is kind of what you see. You rarely see that many uh, ports being bundled together. You normally see kind of two or four ports nonetheless that's what we can have so why you for channels bandwidth is a really good reason why it gives us that flexibility of upgrading bandwidth without having to replace the physical interfaces on the actual device itself the other thing is of course redundancy it adds that level of redundancy to us because if we've got two links between switches rather than one link and we have, or we have three, four links between switches and they're bundled together, then it allows us to actually still continue to operate if a link goes down. So really, really good. Now the downside to Ether channels, because there's obviously a downside to everything, is that you can get issues with low balancing. And this is kind of outside the scope of the CCNA, at least it's not putting on the actual blueprint and it's definitely something in the CCMP, but effectively the load balancing for the Ether channel is done by LACP. And if LACP is not being set up with the correct algorithm, then you may see traffic push on one link and not so much traffic on the other link. So that is a downside of Ether channels. I'm not gonna go into kind of how you would fix that and the details behind that, but notice that depending on the low balancing algorithm that's used on the low, on the actual lag itself, you may see traffic go on one link and not the other link. And the other issue is actually the flow speed. Um, and what I mean by kind of kind of flow speed is well, let's say for example, you have again um, a switch PC connected behind it, and that switch connects up to the internet and you go on to a speed test website and you know speedtest.com or whatever and you run your speed test and let's say for example that this here is 100 me uh, megabits per second and this is 100 megabits per second and let's just say the internet also gives you 100 meg well what you'd expect from this is of course 100 meg speed great but let's say now as an engineer 
you know that the internet is a lot faster than 100 meg. And what you want to do is actually say, hmm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to upgrade the customer's or the end user's NIC card to one gigabit per second. And I'm going to add another port here between the switch and the device in the cloud. And I'm going to lag it. So I'm going to pull it inside an ether channel. So now what you're thinking is actually I've now got two times 100 megabits per second. Brilliant. And I've got a one gigabit per second down to the network interface card and in PC. Brilliant. And I know the internet can go a lot faster. So my bottleneck is of course this here. And two times 100 is of course 200 megabits per second. So when I run a speed test, I should see 200 megabits per second. Well, unfortunately, with Ether channels, that's not the case. Because what happens is when our device goes to speedtest.com, that creates what we call a flow. And I'm not going to get into too much detail what a flow is, but effectively, each flow can only ever go down one link. So when we say load balancing with Ether channel, the correct term from my perspective is load distribution. Because what we're not doing is we're not balancing each flow across each link. Instead, what we're doing is we're putting one user's request this way, one user's request this way, one user request this way, one user request this way. And it is in a sense low balancing, but it's rather low balancing on um not on a per browser or per um, application or per packet. It's doing it per flow and the flow is determined by the algorithm of LACP. So it's important to know that only because you add more bandwidth doesn't mean you're going to see that bandwidth at the end user's perspective. So you're kind of adding more capacity in a sense, not kind of throughput. And that's an important distinction to know uh, because obviously Ether channels will help us with our capacity management, but it won't effectively give us more throughput per se. So it does sound a little bit complex and I know I've kind of gone off off the tracks a little bit there and I know Ether channels sometimes when I speak to people about them get a little bit confused. But you, like I said, when we go on Packet Tracer, you'll see it's relatively straightforward. And all we're doing is we've got a link between two devices, in this case, two switches. You want to add another link, maybe another one or three links. And all we're doing is creating a bundle or an ether channel or a lag between these two devices, allowing them to communicate through LACP, the link aggregation control protocol, to agree that there are three ports and these ports are X speed and got certain configuration and so forth. So an ether channel at its core is really, really straightforward. But what it allows us to do from span entry, from routing and from other point of views a huge benefit and that's why we need to understand them in a bit of detail uh, and for the ccna the ccna wants us to understand what is an ether channel and also what is lacp which is the protocol that allows us to negotiate an ether channel now there are other protocols that negotiate that and you can even form a ether channel without using a protocol but that is outside the scope of the ccna so for now, all we got to understand is why Ether channels are there, how we would configure them using LACP and how to verify them. And lastly, we know what layer two and layer three means. We've discussed that multiple times throughout the course. But effectively, you can see I was using um, the LACP there or lags as uh, between switches and the assumption is that those switches were layer two but they could have been layer three it could be layer three switches so it's important that we understand that the ether channel itself can be layer two or it can be layer three and the other thing that's worth noting is lacp has an ieee which means that lacp is open standard and the other uh, variations of LA, uh, LACP, like uh, PAGP, uh, is Cisco proprietary. But that's not on the blueprint. 
So we're not going to worry about this. All we're going to worry about for now is LACP, what is an Ether channel, understanding the concept, configure and verify. So let's jump on Packet Tracer and have a look. So here we, here we are inside Packet Tracer. Just going to pull across a couple of switches. Let's connect a couple of cables between them. And then we can see uh, fast Ethernet 01 to fast Ethernet 01, fast Ethernet 02 to fast Ethernet 02. Real straightforward. And we have kind of two switches. We can click on the CLI. Okay. Let me just give them new host names. So in order to actually configure the ether channel between the two devices, we do this at a port level and we actually use the command channel group. So very straightforward. So let's just go ahead and put that on the interfaces. And then we specify which member, and this is locally significant. However, when you're creating channel groups between switches, try to use the same if uh, try to use the same channel group. Like I said, locally significant, but when you're troubleshooting in the real world, it's important to sort of keep them the same to help other engineers out. So let's just call it channel group one. And then we've got to specify which mode we want. Now the mode's the kind of real important bit here because the mode basically allows us to uh, figure out whether we're doing LACP or PAGP or whether we just want to enable it without using a protocol. Now, I said that this all could be done, but as far as we're concerned at the CCA level, all we need to know is LACP. And as such, there are only really two commands we need to be aware of here, which is active and passive. Now, active and passive, as you can kind of guess, one actively tries to negotiate and the other one passively waits. Now, long as one side is active, the, the actual channel will always work. So if we do this guy on this side as active, this one over here as passive, then the EVA channel will work. If we do them both as active, the EVA channel will work. If we do this one as passive and this one as active, the EVA channel will work. If this one is passive and this one is passive, the ether channel will not work. So active, passive, keep that in mind. Make sure one side is at least active. You can do both sides of active if you wish. Okay, so here we're gonna just pop in the mode active, done. And what we're also gonna do is we're gonna go to the other interface, which was zero two, and we're gonna put the same command there. And then we're gonna verify it. So show ether channel summary is your main command that you're going to be using for the verification. And we can see that I created a port channel. So this is, like I said previously, this is the logical interface. And inside this logical interface, I have two uh, physical interfaces, which is 01, 02, which are the two interfaces between the two switches. And I'm using the protocol LACP, the link aggregation control protocol. Now, what's really important from this output is, of course, the state that it's in. Now, you know, and I know, because we have access to this switch over here, that nothing was configured. And because nothing was configured, we can see that the ports have this little I next to them, or capital I. And that means, if we look at the table at the top, they're in stand alone, which means even though this side is configured as an EFA channel, it's not acting like an ether channel. It's keeping those ports separate. So even though that config's there, it's not working. So that's important to know because if you're in obviously the real world or you're in a troubleshooting environment, make sure that both sides agree that they are bundling between them. And the reason it's not working is of course, like I said, we've not done the other one. So let's go ahead and do the other side. 
Another thing that's worth noting when doing EFA channels is you can use the interface range command. And an interface range command allows you to apply config to two ports at the same time. So it's just something to put in mind because now we only got to type the command once. So I've done passive on this side. And like I said, long as one side's active, we should be good. And then let's do our verification. Now notice I've caught it during its actual uh, initiation. And you can see that one is gone into P, which is the port is in the channel. And one is an I, which is standalone. So let's just do it again. Now, both ports have gone into the channel. And over here, both ports are in the channel. So that means now, right now, we have simply con con uh, configured a ether channel, also known as a lag, a link aggregation, between these two switches. So right now, if I had uh, PCs over here, PCs over here, PCs here, and again, a bunch of PCs, there's a good chance that when they actually communicate, that traffic at some point will use both links through some method. So whether that's kind of maybe this client and this client will use the top link, and this client and this client will use the bottom link, and this client and this client will use the bottom link, and this client and this client will use the top link. So you'd have different flows of traffic going across those links. And the switches will completely agree because they're using that uh, LACP. They will agree that the ports are actually in a bundle, as we can see from the show Ether channel summary. So that's how we create a layer two Ether channel using LACP. And that's also how we use uh, the verification command show Ether channel summary by looking at the port status and verifying that port status against the actual legend. Because we can see at the top here, there's lots of different uh, states that the ports can be in, but effectively we're looking for that P port. Now, what's also important is that now the actual channel has come up, we can see the type of channel. We can see an S and a U. And if we look at the top again, we can see the capital S means layer two. So we have a layer two ether channel. And we can also see the U, which means it's in use. Now, other verification commands can be used now with a port channel. Oh, it's, uh... So for example, you can see here that when I do show interface status, you can see it actually shows as PO1. And when you do, now this is maybe not supported, but what you can actually do is look at the switch port configuration for that ether channel. But effectively what we're doing here is this is like a support command. What we're doing here is we're looking at the actual port channel itself. We can see it's up, the protocol's up, it has its own MAC address, and we can see it's actually passing traffic in and out. And then obviously again, we can see that it's set up there in the network uh, interface status. Now we've configured it using that channel group command. So the, the commands are a little bit odd in, in one sense or another because the verification command is different to the actual configuration commands. But unfortunately, that's kind of the way it is. And also, unfortunately, in different releases of Cisco, it's actually different commands. It's sometimes referred to as bundle interfaces, etc. Uh, but unfortunately, that's Cisco for you. Uh, so there is a lot of terminology batting around and we'll sort of clean that to topology up and make uh, terminology up and make sure we're all aware of it towards the end of the video. So wrapping up where we are with the commands. So underneath the physical interface is where you're going to do the configuration for the ether channel. And we're going to use the command channel group followed by a locally significant number that represents that group and whether you want it to be active or passive. And I've mentioned this already, what active and passive means, but very straightforward. That one simple command creates that channel for you. Now there are obviously many other commands for ether channels, but 
they're not covered at the moment. That's all we need to worry about is how to actually create that channel. And then the kind of the the single show command, which is that show Ethernet summary. Sorry, show Ether channel summary, which shows us kind of how the ports are behaving inside the channel and what protocols we used for the channel and the state of them. So it's very easy, very straightforward uh, commands in order to actually build an Ether channel at a very fundamental uh, level. It's also worth noting that we obviously built a layer two channel in Packet Tracer. And in the next video, we'll look at doing a layer three channel. So that's all we've got time for in this video, just to kind of go over what we've learned, because obviously it was a bit of a brain dump, especially if this was your first time ever hearing about Ether channels. What you probably would have frustratingly heard me say is multiple terminologies, just to kind of confirm what they all actually mean. The term Ether channel is a Cisco term. Cisco uses that a lot. And effectively, it's their term for what we call a lag, a link aggregation. And the link aggregation is kind of the open standard way of saying it. LACP is the link aggregation control protocol, which is the open standard protocol that's used to build those lags or to build those Ether channels. You may also hear it referred to as Nick Teeman. Nick teaming is when you actually have kind of like a server and that server has, let's say, uh, a NIC card and it connects into two different uh, access switches. That there is kind of NIC teaming because it's the NIC itself also doing the actual lag. Uh, and if you're wondering here, hang on a minute, Ryan, why is there one port going to this switch and one port going to this switch? This is called an M lag and that's a CCMP, CCIE topic. So just worry about the terminology Nick Teeman means the same as Ether channels. You also hear it called port channels and you also hear it called channeling. So there's a lot of terminology mixed up in there, but it's important that you understand kind of, or at least with, you know, from a, a, if someone says these keywords, you know what they're referring to. We went and understood why we actually need the Ether channels. They allow us to incrementally upgrade the bandwidth for capacity available in our networks. They add resiliency. They do a lot of things for us. So they're great and they're easy to configure. We went over the benefits and the pitfalls. So Ether channels aren't always as straightforward as what you've seen it, especially when you're doing inter-vendor Ether channels. Sometimes they behave uh, unexpectedly and bring down ports you don't want to bring down. And then we jumped into Packet Tracer and we configured a layer two ether channel. And in the next video, we'll have a look at layer three. I hope this video has been informative and I'd like to thank you for viewing. And if it has been, please do like and subscribe.